Thank you. Um, Jamie Court is here from Consumer Watchdog. Uh, Jamie, I, I, I don't want to blindside you, but I also want to make sure we stay on schedule. So okay. I'm going to ask you to really try to focus on, since I, I know what you're going to say in terms of competition, as an economist, I think there's, and I think a market watcher, there's a difference between just high profits and lack of competition. And so what you can contribute on sort of telling us about what you think is going on with competition, not just harping on high pro profits, I'd appreciate. Okay. I'll try to take 10 minutes uh, just to give the critique of uh, what we think is new. We've talked a lot great. about chronically low inventories. I do want to remind people about the high gas prices, though, because you know, we're looking at a really extreme situation. You could blame 20 cents a gallon difference with America on uh, environmental standards, taxes, which have actually gone down by six cents because the excise tax dropped to nine cents. But we're looking at a dollar a gallon difference, which we've seen most of uh, most of the spring and summer throughout California, a buck fifty difference with U.S. prices. That's really an extraordinary circumstance. And when you look to those high prices matching and correlating almost directly, do the next slide, which is the higher margins for the refiners. This is a CEC slide. You will see that the crude oil uh, last year was making up the lion's share of a gallon of gas uh, by the CEC standards in July of 2014, a $4 gallon of gas. And in July, where we're hitting $4 in LA, the difference is where the money's going. The refiners were making $0.47 cents in July of 2014 as a margin in costs and profits. And in July of 2015, that went to a buck sixty-one. We're talking about you know, almost four times the difference going into the refiner's pockets. Next slide. And the refiners always love to say, okay, margins are not profit. Well, we do know, and this is a recommendation specifically I want to talk to you about profit. We know from two of the oil companies exactly how much they made on oil refining in the state of California. And as a recommendation, we think oil, all oil refiners have to let us know. Uh, Tesoro reports oil refining in California. It had the best second quarter in oil refining ever in, the 15, in, in its history since we've been looking at the data. And the same is true with Valero. Valero had an 1,100% increase in its oil refining profits from California. That is profit. Next slide. Chevron does not report oil refining in California, but they do report oil refining profits. And their profits in the second and first quarter, the first half of this year on oil refining, they had the best first half of 2015 ever on oil refining in America and 54% of the refineries in California. So we can do a little math there. And they're saying very specifically, as of all the refiners who've reported these profits, it's tight supply, and that boosted refining and marketing margins and increased our earnings. Where crude oil was not a profit center, oil refining in California and the West specifically has. So we know low inventories. Um, this is a CEC chart that I just put up because we can see going from August of last year, uh, we have had chronically low inventories out of that blue band until May and June, which I want to talk about in a little bit. And again, you can see coming back into the summer and out of the summer, we went back into the normal range. What causes low inventories? Down refineries, I can only speak a little to that because I can't get behind the refinery walls, but we think there should be some mechanism to do that, to see uh, if these refineries are downed why they're down and when they're coming back and whether there's some kind of verification of that process. Excess imports, exports. We have tracked a lot of exports out of the nation. Lack of imports. And then something that you may not have thought about, but there's a lot of backdoor uh, dark trades, we would say, between refiners that aren't accounted for. Uh, wet barrel trades, they're not paper trades, that we think should be accounted for. And we also think there's a lot of misinformation about production, as we can look at the case of Exxon and Torrance, which has led the market astray that we need to cure. Is there enough information? Well. I would just say this. This is a letter that the Western States Petroleum sent you a few days ago saying they will not testify. They have no specific information about supply train disruptions or pricing behavior. If the oil companies won't say, how will we ever know? Which is why the thrust of what we're going to talk about is really, um, please next slide, what we're going to talk about is what they tell investors a little bit, which is we've seen huge crack spreads in California. It's all public information. Tight supply has boosted our margins. And how California goes is how our profits are going to go next quarter. We're going to look at third quarter, but I'm telling you they're going to be better than the second quarter. 
They are telling their investors. They're not telling the state. They're not willing to be honest with you. You were, you were asked to look at market manipulation. And the oil refiners, not only didn't they show up, they sent a letter from their law firm reminding you that you cannot breach confidentiality of data recommendations. That is a slap in the face. And it's something we've got to remedy. The remedy, we believe, is transparency. Now, let me put something on the table we haven't talked about and hasn't been in the media. These are the major price spikes. You'd expect the Exxon Torrance uh, refinery to create one of them, and, and they did. That was when we get, took out 20% of California, Southern California's gasoline supply and 10% of the states. Uh, and then we saw a huge price spike. In two to three weeks, I guess three to four, based on the presentation of Stillwater, we would expect supplies to come back in and price to start falling. And uh, in fact, you know, we are talking about this is the period where you know, prices were extraordinarily high compared to crude oil costs. But then we're looking at um, another period, number two, and that's really what I want to focus on, uh, because this isn't about refineries all going offline at the same time. This is about the way oil refiners use their contractual uh, control over branded gas stations and setting price to keep prices artificially high. Let's go to the next slide. We've noticed, uh, sorry, go back one. Uh, oh, that's okay. No, go back, that's it. We've noticed, uh, and this is, by the way, research done by Cody Rosenfield, who is manning the slides, but might be asked to come up in a little bit and talk about it. There has been an unprecedented gap between retail and wholesale prices. Um, and it's, uh, you know, in the end of 2014, going through uh, really extraordinary in August and September. And it's also happened uh, in May and June. We've noticed, um, if you go to the next slide, that retail prices, uh, and this is something was common by uh, Mr. Sweeney Lillard. They've never been so much higher than uh, wholesale prices. You're right, 77 cents has been the difference since 2000 as an average. In September, we're looking at a buck 20 between retail and wholesale. I mean, someone is getting gouged when that happens, and it's the consumers. These are the highest averages, these are the highest retail uh, wholesale price differences ever. You'll notice they're almost all in 2015. And in October, uh, the end of uh, 2014, when crude oil prices tanked, we started to see a new pricing strategy by this industry. And this gap was a way of keeping Californians paying too much. Next slide. We've also noticed, if you peel it back a little bit, and this is something we started to talk about the last meeting, but we didn't have enough data, there is a huge difference at times when we have added with inventory between branded and unbranded prices at the rack. A huge difference. And that's something that uh, is historically an abnormality. It's usually about a four cents difference between branded and unbranded at the rack. And we're talking, this isn't a quarterly average, so you can see it's gone up towards 20, but we are seeing at times, uh, next slide, that uh, there are 30 to 35 cents differences at the rack. Cody, next slide. There, that's good. 30 to 35 cents differences. In 2015, we had a lot of weekly peaks with 30 cents differences between unbranded and branded at the rack. Now, why is that happening? Why is that happening? Uh, it correlates, of course, with profits for the oil refiners, but let me, let me tell you what we think it's happening. We believe that when there's sufficient inventory coming into the state, as we had in May and June, where the imports all flooded and we started getting to that normal band of inventories, that the brand did that what the oil refiners did to keep the street price artificially high, which it was, is to charge their branded gas stations 30 to 35 cents more than the unbranded stations. The independent stations are a small part of the market. I, I don't have an exact number. We think about 15%. The branded stations are 85% of the market. And when you have stations at 85% of the market paying 30, 35% cents above what the natural you know, wholesale price of fuel is, it keeps prices artificially high. It keeps the street price artificially high until the next import doesn't come in or the next refinery breaks. The profits for Tesoro show and Valero that there is a straight curb uh, going up uh, with the extra dollars charged to branded stations over this period. You would expect there would be periods where if inventories come back online, price would go down, profits would go down. This is a pricing strategy to keep profits going through the roof. I'll go to the next slide, please. These are the months with the highest unbranded station margin. Jamie, can I interrupt yeah. you for just a second? So I'm trying to... Yeah, and this, this goes together. together. And um, so the suggestion is, and I, and I think um, Gordon actually documented this in a previous meeting, that California has a very high share of branded dealers relative to other states. And 
um, in order to buy branded gasoline, you have to buy it as branded from the producer. And so they can price them separately. They normally price them just a few cents separately, but you're saying that we've seen unusually high spreads. For long periods of time. For but long, this, is what, this is kind yep, of what this yep. is showing, yeah. And the piece of that that makes California different, this is, in a sense, not about carb gasoline. This is about the retail structure. And it's about that even though there are safe ways out there, and just to pick a name, our Costco is charging very much lower prices. Not enough people will substitute to that or can or have access easily to. And so you don't see the downward pressure on those brands. Well, well it's, even, it's even more. It's that an unbranded station, if it's getting gas 30 cents cheaper or 35 cents cheaper, is going to price its product five cents, four cents, three cents lower than the branded station and make a lot of money, which is why this chart well, shows, shows that the brand, unbranded sector in these months where there are high inventory made unusually high margins. And, and I'm sure there's some of that, but we do live in a capitalist economy where we think competition has something. I don't to have do any problem with the unbranded stations. My no, no, but I, I'm wondering why, why aren't we seeing the unbranded price driven down, and I think the explanation that one would take from your presentation is that there just aren't that many unbranded stations, and so even when they get a good, a much lower price, uh, they get to absorb a larger share of it because the Costco isn't right next to the Safeway, isn't right next to the um, Rotten Robbies for our Northern California folks, um, and so they, they, they can price up to some extent, to the branded stations. Yeah, yeah, they price closer to the branded stations, although at still a significant discount, right. so it's notable, noticeable. But you do see in their margins in these months, like uh, August and September, where we had that big wholesale retail price, you'll see their margins, which are usually 20 cents, are now 70 cents, 60 cents, uh, 50 cents. They're, take, they're, they're, they're taking more money for themselves, and they're now, still giving a lot to the consumer. Do you have northern southern breakouts? My memory is from many we're looking at this years ago that Southern California actually has a much higher share of unbranded than Northern California does. Um, we don't. Well, this is all CEC data. Uh, maybe okay. Um, okay. we could ask our yeah, friend from the independent market. Come. But I, I do. I do uh, think that w together with the inventory problems, it puts together another little piece of of, of yep. the problem. Uh, and maybe we could then translate that in, into the solution. Um, and Jamie, yeah. before you go on, I, I want to see if you would agree that this may be part of the answer to the question I asked a, a few minutes ago. Uh, if you look over the last four years, the, the, the margin between rack and retail prices of um, branded stations went up about 20 cents, unbranded went up 40 cents, and if, in fact, the price of the branded at the rack was pushed up 15 or 20 cents, which I think is what your data said, that would say that the unbranded were probably competitively following the branded stations. They were having some gap, a little bit cheaper, but how much cheaper probably didn't change over time. So that could be at least consistent with what drove that price differential. And first, that's the first question. And just second, I point out that if you look at the data of that Northern versus Southern California, you see almost no difference between the two. So, um, you mean in the behavior? I think that, I think. In, in the differentials, mm -hmm. in the differentials. You, I, I agree, I agree. comment on that, is yeah. that sort of what you're seeing in your analysis, or is it something different? Yes, I mean, what we saw is, is that the, the competitive price is staying close in that region. There's not a huge discount to the consumers. Uh, we, I mean, the only difference we're seeing Southern California, which you've noticed, is just that because uh, Southern California has disproportionately impacted, the, pr the, the overall prices are so much higher, but we're not seeing any undercutting of the major brands by the independent sector now. So what this is saying is that the differential between branded and unbranded probably doesn't make much difference. It's just who captures the profit is influenced, whether it's the independent stations or the refiners, 
Uh, well, for, it, makes, it makes a big yeah. difference from the consumer's point but of view. But the consumer yeah. pushes it up. The it pushes every, yeah, pushes every, it, it, I mean, it explains why we're paying so much more for our gasoline than the rest of America after you take out the taxes and the environmental standards of 20 cents, why we're up at a buck, and how, and, and this is what I think is really important. We believe, but we can't go into the refinery, that the oil refiners, and this goes to our next point, have been keeping us on very low inventories as a... Uh, as a, uh, I apologize for but, butting in. This is Ryan Eggers from the California Energy Commission. We've had a request from online. If um, we could start announcing ourselves before we start um, any questions, they would very much appreciate okay. it. Thank Fair you. Enough. That was Jim Sweeney asking that question. Um, so so th- th- we believe there's a two-part punch here. I just haven't wanted to go too much into inventories. But, you know, look, if you look at California gas inventory and refining profits as a historical proposition, which is what Cody put together, you'll see that as as inventories go down, profits go up. Same thing is true again with Valero, our two companies, which I don't like to give kudos to, but they are giving us good data as to their profitability and their supply. So if you look at Valero, it's exactly the same thing on a historical basis. So one way you see in in, in this last little chart, though, in 2015, for the sustaining of those profits in periods where there's not low inventories is this strategy of going to – Give the independence or the unbranded what we think of as the true competitive price on the rack, and we don't know the dealer tank wagon for the fuel. And by charging, you know, 85% of the station 30, 35 cents more, able to keep the price at the pump so much higher than what it ordinarily should be in a, in a really competitive market. If you go to the next slide, so that's what we explain in this chart with. Just just to be really clear, that you have these periods where we go back into the normal inventory period. And yet we still have the price, we actually have price spikes going right with them. And maybe prices are coming down, but not moderating enough. Then you, this was what we saw in May and June, where we had the market flooded with fuel, and then we had this pricing strategy. Now, I want to talk a little about that last piece of the puzzle, which is um, July 1, and, and I think it was referred to earlier. On July 1, there were no imports. There were no imports in the state. Uh, there was some opportunities in South America for gas, but why were there no imports? Because... Exxon was believed to be coming back online through Opus reports uh, in Torrance and through uh, other market reports in the media, though we couldn't ever find anything directly attributable to Exxon because there wasn't transparency, and there's no way, given what we know now, that Exxon could have come back online in July. I mean, there's just no way. The market didn't anticipate it, and we didn't have imports. And as you go back to the chart, go back one, Cody. That's what you see there. The market responded with $4 per gallon gasoline in L.A. That's when we had $4 per gallon gasoline. We had this period of high inventory, and when the inventories go down again. It's that misinformation. It's the two-step. Until again, by the way, if you look at, uh, we see inventories coming back at the end of summer, right? You see we're back in that that normal range. Well, that's when we start to see that pricing strategy we just said. Because in these periods, we are not seeing a big differential between branded and unbranded. This is not consistent. The... 30 cent difference between unbranded and unbranded is when we come back into the normal range on inventories. It's not consistent. There are weeks. I think it was at the end of July, Cody, that we saw it go back down to four cents, and then it went back up to 30. So, so can, yeah. I, can I ask a question, you know, in, in the interest of accuracy? So uh, this summer, we had an unexpected rise in gasoline use as consumers uh, responding to the overall lower level of the prices, not relative to California, but nationally in, in general. Um, there was a lot of summer, more summer driving than we've seen in the past. Some people attribute that to more millennials getting employed or the higher employment rate. Some people, you know, could say, well, 4th of July um, and summer traveling. Um, have you adjusted uh, uh, what you're saying for that increase in supply? Because theoretically, if demand was higher than expected, um, then that would drain inventories faster than people expected because um, people were not anticipating that increase in demand. Well, that certainly exacerbated the problem, but we're looking at a pretty consistent pattern until we got to the uh, period. I think the high demand was only at the end of summer, right? It was in July, and it was not you know, a significant boost in demand. So... I mean, this is, a, this is a historical pattern really going back to August of last year because we saw a huge export of, of fuel out of California, the biggest ever in December. The market got dried in December. Now, people would say that's rational because crude oil was right, the margin was, you get rid of it. But that's what really looks when you see that, you, you see the price 
spike, you know, the price going up relative to that really started uh, in, uh, you know, in, in January. It just wasn't a pronounced uh, increase, and crude oil price was low throughout that whole period. So this is really a historical problem. But yeah, it can be exacerbated by an, an intensification of demand. Uh, but it would also be, uh, let's go forward, Cody. It would also be a lot better. Go back, go backward. We, 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 when we knew that demand was high, it'd be a lot better if, if we actually had some accurate information about what was wrong at Exxon and Torrance, and when 20% of our gasoline was going to come back online. And when you get this type of misinformation in the market, some people, uh, it's very hard to get that three to four week import. You know, I had heard it was two to three weeks import because no one in that market who's going to bring that gasoline in knows what. It's going to happen in three to four weeks. If we know that uh, it's not till September or February that we're going to see uh, Exxon Torrance coming back online, we're going to have a much uh, much more steady stream of imports or much more uh, or, or much greater trading in gasoline, and that's the real problem. So what do we know? I'll just I'll wrap up, and I think we've talked. You know, take your questions on it. But we know, we know that price spikes and refiner profit spikes occur simultaneously. That's historic. They've just been more dramatic. We know that low inventories and low production equate with price spikes, and we know they also equate with profit spikes. Demand, by the way, historically, we have looked at demand historically. Demand has dropped historically. Uh, this summer, there was, I think, at the end of July, an uptick in demand. But we were already seeing these, uh, these, these machinations all the way from February when demand was uh, consistent. We also know, and this is what we're trying to put on the table here today for conversation, that when inventories normalize in a price spike period, refiners use their contractual leverage over the branded station to keep pump prices artificially high. And that's abetted by the fact there's little transparency about those prices. So, Jamie, are you suggesting that that's something different than five years ago? Yes, absolutely. And why? Well, because five years ago, the brand, there, there was only one period over the last 15 years where there was a 30 cent spread between unbranded and branded racks. And it was no, 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 I, that's yeah. not a why. That's the, that's the evidence. I'm asking what was the cause, do you think? The cause of the... Uh, of, uh, so, you're, so why wasn't this a strategy the refiners were using? I wish the oil refiners were here to answer that question. I suspect well, they're not here because they don't want to. But if you ask me to speculate, I'll tell you a couple of reasons. The crude oil market as a profit center has dried up for the companies. One, just as an economic reason, this is a way to milk more money out of, out of a gallon. Yeah, but that's not an argument for Tesoro or Valero. Well, they're this is really. an argument for Tesoro or Valero. Do you see their profit reports? We're having a re they They're not in the crude oil. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, you're saying, yeah. yeah. So, so I you, well I because mean, they can. It's a more you know I I don't I don't really I don't, really, I, I don't know yeah. no no but I mean I do I trying also, to determine trying to sort of put some meat on this okay if you really want me to speculate why weren't they doing it five years ago if this is the cause it seems well like five years ago they were making money across the uh, across the board I think for 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 all the companies but also I think that honestly and this is a speculation and this is a political speculation but I play a little bit a couple of blocks down the oil companies wanted to punish California because we have tough environmental fuels, and whether it's true that they raise the price of gas or not, they want to be able to point to California. And when other people want to do a greenhouse gas emission cap, they want to say, you know what, they're paying in gasoline in California. Now, we can prove that carbon credits cost 10 cents a gallon, right? That's just, that's fact. But they can say, and it's fact, that gas prices are more in California than the rest of America. What they're not saying is it's because we can charge them more, and they're finding every way in the book to do it. And it was quite interesting that when we finished our legislative uh, debate season, uh, across the street, there was a 20 cent drop in the, in the gallon of gas in LA, literally almost overnight. I think there's political reasons why they kept gasoline prices high, and I think there's mechanisms to do it. It's a speculation, uh, but I believe that, and I believe it's another reason why the governor really needs to take action on this. Okay, and speculate. Do you have any evidence whatsoever in support of that, or is it just your speculation? Well, if I had a memo like that, I'd be filing an antitrust case. Okay, uh, so uh, it's uh, just spec. It's it, just your speculation. Well, it's not our evidence. speculation. Right. There is some evidence. I should say this: there is some evidence. There was a presentation given by the Western States Petroleum Association that became public last November by Bloomberg News, and in it, it said, "We are going to defeat cap and trade and other greenhouse gas rules by showing through affiliates that the gas prices in California are going to go up 70 cents." There is a memo that says that. Now, it didn't say they were going to do it in the market. They said, we're going to make that case. But do you notice the retail margin was $0.77 cents coming into this year, retail wholesale margin, and it went up, what, $0.60, cents, $0.70? Cents? 
I don't have uh, proof other than the fact that they had a political scheme to make the case that higher gas prices are the reason we don't want environmental fuel. And then in the market, we found gas prices going up. I, 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 that's all I can say. Okay. Uh, but let me just finish up. Uh, we don't have enough information about supply um, to determine the cause of major disruptions in the industry. Here is their answer. We're not going to tell you. No specific information about supply disruption or pricing behavior. I think it's very odd that they hadn't come today, uh, especially because this body was charged a year ago with making sure what happened to California just didn't ha didn't, couldn't happen, and it did. And now they don't want to answer for it. And they knew if they didn't uh, come uh, previously, perhaps it could have had a political price. Their position is this, and it's all from the letter. The less info we have, the more profit they make. This is from their law firm basically reminding you that there are confidentiality provisions in all the laws that disclose information to the California Energy Commission. And so um, here's what we believe. This is what the public doesn't know, and we think they should. Dealer tank wagon pricing. We don't know those. We don't know those only very generally in certain circumstances, is when the dealer sells. We should know this. We don't know about refiner to refiner trades and prices. We don't know about imports and exports as an overall picture publicly. We don't know, and this I really think is outrageous, the California Energy Commission does not get a report when a refinery goes down and when it's going to come back up. OSHA does about, ref about refinery maintenance, about planned refinery, but the Energy Commission doesn't get a mandated report. They may get private information. They should get that information, and the public should have restart dates and they should keep to that plan. And the reason is, if the market knows that Exxon Torrance isn't coming back until September or February, which is really true, we would have had not had these price differentials. We would not have had these inventory problems because there would have been a market for six months to compensate for that. We don't know the profits from all the major refiners. We don't. We know them from two of them, and we should, the refining profits. And we don't know the what the plans the refiners have when, inventory, when, when a refinery goes down that controls 20% of the gasoline supply to get it back online. We should ask the refiners to give us an inventory plan. I'm not saying to keep a days of supply on hand. That's something the legislator sure won't do. I think it, it, it's, it's a logistical issue. I'm saying we need a plan. The oil refiners of the state have been making so much money off such scarcity. We need a plan from them that says if our refineries go down in three to four weeks, we're going to be importing and here's where we're going to be importing from, and these price spikes won't be lasting more than three to four weeks for that reason. It's a simple proposition. So that's our solution, transparency. Prices along the supply chain, refinery schedules and outages, refining profits, detailed import-export data, so we can keep track of the gas, so we can keep track of the prices, and the inventory plan. Now, I would say this. There are those in the industry who say, we can't do that, because if we did that, our competitors, our competitors would know what we're holding, and we'd be able to game the market. And I'm not being rhetorical when I say, could they game it any more than they did this year? They made historic profits off a dollar differential with America. And they know, because they have Bloomberg terminals, because they have shared terminals, can, can what I, the others are holding. Can I just yeah? share for the record that uh, increasingly companies uh, in the big data field are collecting visual records of inventories, um, and that, 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 those records are available for purchase by traders and refiners in the marketplace. Um, and so there is, within the industry, I believe, very concrete information about refinery levels and, and some of that higher level of intelligence uh, that's probably not available to the public, so just making that point on the record. And it's not just the public. It's this committee at the last meeting couldn't get very basic data from the government, and yet the refiners really do have an unbelievable vantage point on each other. Registering, uh, we know about, for instance, uh, paper trades, right? Because there's a commodities market in paper trades. We don't know about wet barrel trades. Why should we? We know about paper trades. Why shouldn't we know about wet barrel trades? Uh, these are, this is all information that will help us put together and help you put together, frankly, pieces of a puzzle and also, I think, prophylactically prevent oil refiners from gaming the system. If they have to file under penalty of perjury that their refinery went out for a reason, is coming back online for a reason, we're not going to see the type of misinformation that led to the lack of imports in July and that huge price spike. And, I, and as a consumer group, I can say I think that the, uh, we go back to this last slide, uh, go back to the slide from, the, from, from uh, the one more back. This position, one more back, though, Cody, this, this position, one more, uh, that there is no specific information about supply changes or pricing behavior from a trade association. Now, it may be they said that because they don't want to be caught polluting. 
I don't know. Maybe the, the laws against collusion. Collusion is, 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 is preventing them from coming here and testifying. If that's the case, I would challenge them. We're, we're, we're going to get we're going to get all that information out of the open. We're going to ask you to answer for it here. And um, I think the the big thing we really need to think about. Last thing I will say is this: the only way we could go to court, and we would if we could, and legitimately make a case stick, is if we knew there was collusive behavior. If we had two refiners shorting a market, if we had two refiners working together to raise prices to branded gas stations 30, 35 cents, if they talked about it, if they winked, if they nodded, if we caught them on tape in a restaurant going like this, that would be an antitrust violation. But because they're each doing it individually, even though they're doing the same thing, we can't hold them legally or financially accountable. And I believe that if we just put some basic transparency in place and have a plan for inventory controls, that they sign off on, and if they deviate from, they're held accountable for individually, that we will prevent these type of price spikes from lasting more than a couple of weeks, which is what we're trying to cure right now, preventing a price spike from lasting more than a couple of weeks in a world where we have aging refineries and only a dozen of them or so in California that make our gasoline. Okay. Um, and, and I just want to reiterate to make sure I heard correctly what you said. You have no evidence that you're offering that they're engaged in collusive or anti-competitive action. That, that as far as you see, it's all individual, but you don't like what you see individually. Is that a fair summary? Well, if you're asking me, yeah, what I would said. say I have all the evidence that they are acting collusively because they're doing exactly the same thing and making the exact same type of profits. They're not competing. They're withholding supply. And that could, but if you ask me whether I have evidence that they have discussed that plan and, and, and uh, have signed off jointly on it, I have not seen that evidence or I'd be in court already and I wouldn't be here. Okay, so no evidence of collusion, but you just think uh, they... I, I, I believe, I, 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 I want to be really clear there in case this transcript gets into a court. I do believe they're colluding. I don't have evidence that, they, that they've plotted to do it together, but their behavior in the market is absolutely collusive. Because it's, it's the same behavior. None's trying to, you know, look, we didn't, we didn't see a huge imports by, by any refiner trying to flood this market and sell a lot more gas at a lot cheaper price. No one's doing that, and they could do it. Okay. Um, I think we have to stop. It's 1130, and I said we would be we would stop for lunch by noon. So, Gordon, you're, you, if you would join us. Thank you very um, much. Thank you very much, James. Um,